Hello, I'm Karen Parry, manager of the Libraries Just for the Health of It initiative. Today you're going to see a program called The Skinny on Weight Loss by Dr. Ken Friedman. I hope you'll find it very informative. So welcome everyone. How's everybody doing? Fine. Oh, that was a rousing response. How's everybody doing? Come on. You know, it was raining all day today, and, and now the sun came out for a little while, and the rain dried up, so uh, I was really nervous. I was telling John before, I was loading the car, and there was a deluge trying to put the containers in the back of the trunk uh, and holding an umbrella with my chin, but uh, we made it here, and the weather uh, cleared up, so I consider that a very good sign. I'm going to do my very best tonight to share with you as much as I know on a very, very complicated subject. It would seem to be very easy. John and I were talking earlier before, and he said weight loss is pretty easy. It's mathematics. You know, and when you look at animals, you know, if you've had a pet like a dog or a cat, they're born thin. You don't see fat puppies and fat cats being born. They're born thin. And you feed them. And if you feed them the right amount, they seem to have about the best constitution and body weight. And uh, if you feed them too much, they get heavy. And if you feed them less, they lose weight. It seems very simple for animals. Why does it have to be so tough for us? And you speak to three experts, and you get five different opinions. There's so many different approaches. It's no wonder so many people are confused. So I'm going to give you my take on it from my 38 years of experience in helping people not only heal from painful conditions, but also to how to lead a uh, healthier, more productive life. My background and my passion is in chiropractic, which is a philosophy, science, and art that detects and locates and removes interferences to the energy that flows between the brain and body. So that way, if you have an ache, a pain, or a painful condition, you can heal yourself better. You can resist injury. You have stronger immune competence. You have uh, less chance of getting sick. And if you are sick, you tend to heal and respond much more quickly. But when people came to me, especially with what's the number one condition that you would figure people would come to a chiropractor with? Sciatica. Sciatica, back pain, right? It would have to do with the muscles and the joints and especially the lower back. Well, guess what? Most of the people who came to me were overweight. They could benefit to lose 10, 15, 20 pounds or more. Don't get me wrong, I have plenty of skinny patients too. But you know what? Every extra pound on your body is four pounds of stress on your lower back. So it would seem to go hand in hand. And the more weight you carry and the more pain you have, the more sedentary and inactive you tend to become. So if it's a matter of burning calories based upon what you're eating, if you can't move, how can you burn? And it becomes a vicious cycle. So as part of my chiropractic practice, I felt the responsibility to be able to give guidance to the patients who were coming to me who needed help losing weight. And their doctors would say, you need to lose weight. But they weren't really telling them much more than that. Then I became disabled from practice. I had a, a knee injury that happened to me when I was in chiropractic school playing basketball. I went up for a layup, and a guy blocked me and came underneath me. I went down. My knee went one way. My body went the other. I heard a wicked pop. And I couldn't get up. And it was the most horrible pain I ever experienced up to that point. Well, I got checked out by my orthopedist. I was lucky I didn't need surgery. But about 35 years later, my whole joint completely deteriorated. And it started to bow out in this direction. So if you were looking at me head on, my knee looked like this. I walked with a limp, and I couldn't practice. I became disabled. And so I coached other doctors on patient care and clinical excellence and personal growth and professional development. And I did that for eight years. I had an associate doctor that ran my office and saw my patients. And I was there to consult them. But there was a problem. I was inactive. Instead of running around and helping and taking care of people, adjusting them chiropractically, if you've ever been to a chiropractor before, you know how physical this work can be. 
Well, I was sitting down talking on the phone for eight hours a day. I wasn't moving like I used to, and I certainly wasn't working out or skiing or doing the other things that I used to love to do. So guess what? I put on five pounds in a year, but I did it eight years in a row. So at the end of eight years, five pounds a year doesn't sound like much, but at the end of eight years, that's 40 pounds. That's a lot of extra stress on the back and on the knees. And my knee, which was already bad, had a lot of extra weight on it, which made it even worse. So I had a total knee replacement. I had the whole knee replaced. And now it works great. <laughs> but I'll tell you something. I never wanted to go through that again. And at that time, I discovered a program that involved losing weight in a very healthy, natural way, which is physician supervised. And in using this program, what I've been able to do is to guide the patients who have come to me who are overweight, have been told to lose weight, but didn't know what to do. And I've been able to help them. The program that I have is called the Doctor Supervised Chirothin Weight Loss Program. You may have seen the ads in the Sentinel that I run and the articles that I've written. And I have a number of them up here for, uh, for you to take and review if you'd like. But the, and I was able to help a lot of people. But then there were people who would come to me who said, I've been to a number of other, I'm not going to mention any names, but you know them, the nationally advertised weight loss programs. And there's a number of them. And nothing worked for them. Nothing. No matter what they did, no matter what protocol they followed, no matter how much they exercised, no matter what form of exercise they did, no matter how little they eat, it just didn't work for them. They've told me they felt cursed because what worked for everyone else, is this sounding a little familiar? What worked for everyone else didn't work for them. And they were hoping that my program would be the answer to their prayers. But guess what? I found that it wasn't. Now, how could that be? How could it be that so many people who have done certain things and have gotten great results could do, you know, could follow the, the protocol, get great results, and somebody else could do the same things they did and they'd stall, or they'd start out like a house on fire, and then boom, it would stop. There has to be a reason why. That's what I'm here to talk to you about tonight. The whole title of my talk is called The Skinny on Weight Loss, Why Some People Can and Other People Can't Lose Weight. Now, what I want to begin with is I want to rule out the obvious things, for example, pathology. You know, if, if a person has a serious tumor or a serious metabolic disorder, that's something that I can't address and they need to go to a specialist to have that addressed. Another issue could be medication. There are certain medications that make you gain weight, typically because you're retaining water and water weighs more than fat. That's why the fat person floats in the pool. Water weighs more than fat does. What's a medication, one medication that can make you gain weight? Steroids, Steroids like cortisone, prednisone, you blow up. Okay, if you're on medications that are artificially affecting your body's metabolism, it doesn't matter what diet you go on and how you're working out until you figure out a way to address that core issue and get away from those medications, your chances of losing weight are not going to be that great. So let's take that right off the table right away. There are a number of factors that come into play. And I want to begin with function. Because how your body functions determines how well you do with the things that you do. Your metabolism doesn't run all by itself. Your metabolism and your body's chemistry is directed. So what is the organ in your body 
the system in your body that's responsible for controlling and coordinating all of the functions in your body, including your metabolism. Okay, so the endocrine system is very important, okay, but what system runs the endocrine system and the circulatory system? The brain and the nervous system, that's right. The brain and the nervous system, actually, that's not completely true. Because a dead person has a brain and a nervous system, but there's no function. Nothing works. It's like a house that has wiring and lights and appliances, but if the power's out, nothing works. So the brain and the nervous system are there, but the brain and the nervous system, the brain generates the power and the nervous system carries that energy to all of the different parts of the body. So the key really is energy. The nervous system carries that energy. So if the nervous system is permitted to carry energy and that energy flows correctly, then the endocrine system, which is connected to the nervous system, in fact, a lot of, of physiologists feel that the endocrine system and the nervous system are really like this. You can't disconnect them. So if the energy flowing to the endocrine system is flowing properly, then how does the thyroid work, better or worse? Better, it has to. And if something interferes with the flow of energy to the thyroid, then what has to happen to your metabolism? Slows down. Or it increases. increases. In fact, if you look at disease in the human body, if you look at disease, let me, let me make it really simple for you. Disease is really too much or not enough. And if you look at medications, most medications are really designed to hypo the hyper or hyper the hypo. Isn't that right, Gary? Okay, so it's too much or not enough. Hyperthyroidism, hypothyroidism. High blood pressure, low blood pressure. Irritable bowel syndrome, constipation. Too much or not enough causes disease within the body. And that includes the endocrine system. So irritation to the nervous system impairs energy, impaired energy flow messes up how your body works. So my whole purpose in what I do is to evaluate a person to find out whether or not their body's firing on all eight cylinders. What that means is, is that whether or not all the energy is flowing between the mind and the body and the body back to the mind again without anything messing with the process. And there's something that really can seriously interfere with this process. And the name of the condition is called vertebral subluxation complex. Vertebral sublux, I know that's a mouthful. I'll call it subluxation for short. A subluxation is an energy disruption let me show you on a plastic spine. So if I have this model spine up and I hold it up, the same way that you're looking at me from the side right now, this would be the back of my head. I'm looking this way toward the corner, my neck, mid back, lower back. And at any level of the spine, this problem, vertebral subluxation complex can occur. What happens, the brain generates the power, the power, runs down the big extension cord, the spinal cord. Who here has a circuit breaker in their home or apartment? Raise your hand. Raise your hand, okay. Have you ever been to your circuit panel before? There's a main line, right, that comes into the panel. And then if you open up the panel and you look at it, you see the main comes in and then there's breakers at different levels which have branches of wires, wires that go out at each level that carry the power to the different rooms in your home or apartment. And you know that if a room loses power or if something's not working, before you start sticking screwdrivers into light sockets and outlets, 
what's the first thing that you do? You go to the breaker panel and you see if they're lined up and, and properly aligned or if one is flipped to one side and then you, if it is flipped to one side, you bring it back, you bring it into alignment, you restore power and energy to the affected area of the house that isn't getting the power. And in the human body, the, basically the same thing happens. In a subluxation, the vertebra slips out of alignment to the point where it can irritate the nerve. Can you see? It goes out of alignment where the nerve becomes irritated. And when that nerve becomes irritated from the spine being out of alignment and stuck out of place, how does the energy flow, good or bad? How does the body function, good or bad? That's right. So my whole objective is to evaluate someone to detect if they have these subluxations. Oh, that's easy, doc. I feel fine. I must be okay. I probably don't have any subluxations. Can you feel fine and, not have, a, and, not, and have a cavity in your sure. tooth? Mm -hmm. Can you feel fine and have blockages in your heart? Sure. Can you feel fine and have cancer inside your body? Sure. Yep. You get in the picture? Well, the spine in and of itself does not have many nerves that give you feeling. So you could have a, if you did, if you could really feel deep inside your spine, the subtlest movement could be painful. So the way that we're wired, and it's, it's interesting, it's almost paradoxical, that the center of the body that's carrying most of the energy doesn't have a lot of feeling inside of it, like your fingertips or the inside of your mouth. 50% of the, of the nerves that carry feeling from the brain, 50% go to the mouth. They say if an adult had to go through teething like a baby, you'd go out of your mind with pain. Why do you think people complain about going to the dentist? It hurts, okay? But in the spinal column, there aren't a lot of nerves there. So you can't feel when you have a subluxation. And many times, the only time you do know if you're waiting to feel something is after it's very well established. Now, if these nerves are carrying energy to the thyroid, your metabolism gets thrown off to the kidneys, to the liver. You can't eliminate, you can't metabolize toxins. And this leads me to another issue. When people have done a number of different weight loss programs, they want to lose weight, they're eating a relatively low calorie diet, they start to lose a couple of pounds and then boom, they hit a brick wall and they can't lose any more weight. Does anyone here by show of hands, anyone here know of someone that that's happened to? Raise your hands, okay? Everybody. Well, they're not cursed and here's why it happens. What's the organ in the body that's the waste treatment plant? This organ does hundreds of functions, but the liver. The liver is the number one organ that's responsible for pack, packaging up, collecting waste, packaging it up, and then getting rid of it. What, if the en what happens if the energy to the liver, or if the liver is not capable, if it can't function at its best, or the toxic load that a person is subjecting themselves to is so high that the liver can't keep up with its toxic load. Who here remembers I Love Lucy, okay? You remember the Chocolate Factory episode where Lucy's on the assembly line and the chocolates are coming her way and when the line is moving nice and slow, she takes the chocolates and she neatly puts them into the box and packages them up one by one. That's what the liver's supposed to do with toxins in our body. 
But remember what happened to Lucy when those chocolates started coming faster and faster? She couldn't keep up. She started stuffing them in her pockets, then into her mouth, and then they started flying all over the place. Well, in the human body, what happens when the toxic load exceeds the liver's capacity to be able to metabolize those toxins is that the liver has to do something. It has to put the toxins somewhere. It can't get rid of them. So what's the one place inside of the human body that's furthest away from your physiology, furthest away, in other words, where it can do the least amount of damage, but it still remains inside? Where does the liver put the toxins? In the fat. It sticks it in the pantry. It puts it in the pantry. Now, here we go. You go to lose weight. And if you're doing it the right way, you're going to lose weight from muscle or fat? If you're going to lose weight the right way, what are you going to do? It's got to be from the fat, right? But wait, the liver took the toxins and put them in the? in the fat, in the pantry, all right? And it's not only belly fat, it's heart fat, liver fat, you know, fat infiltrates the major organs. Okay, it goes everywhere, in muscle too. Now, you go on a diet, you go to exercise, you wanna metabolize fat. Okay, so the fat starts to get burned, but then what happens? Those toxins that were inside the fat now get reintroduced into the system. And the liver, which couldn't keep up with its present toxic load, now has to deal with the extra dump. And the liver is a very powerful organ. You can't live without one. And if the liver can't keep up with its toxic load and, the metabolize, and, and, the, and fat metabolism, what it will do is it'll shut down weight loss. The liver has the capacity to shut it down, and that's why it stops, regardless of how little you're eating or how much you're exercising. That's the mechanism behind it. And you're not going anywhere. So people get told many times, erroneously, that they have a sluggish metabolism. Right. But they don't. It's math, unless your body won't, so it's math, but it's not math. Because if your body won't allow fat, you know, fat metabolism, then you're not losing weight. So then what is a person supposed to do? They have to detoxify the liver and the kidneys and the intestines. There's a condition called leaky gut syndrome. Who here has ever heard of that, leaky gut, where when a person is ingesting things, whether they're medications and or things that are highly inflammatory to the body, productive of systemic inflammation, the three key things in the American diet that are most dangerous, what I call the three stooges that we typically find in the American diet that are worst for you are processed sugar, okay, Sugar, it's white, but no, not salt. Sugar and what? Nope. Breaks down into sugar. By the way, uh, I'm thinking of bread, pasta. You know, what's that? What category is that? Sugar and then what's in pasta and bread? Wheat. 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 Wheat, sugar, and the third thing? Give you a hint. Mm. Dairy. Dairy. Wheat, dairy, and sugar don't belong in our diets, okay? Do you know that the, the wheat that we eat today is genetically modified? We all know that, right? Did you know that the wheat that we eat today breaks down into a carbohydrate that's 10 times sweeter than sugar? Now, sugar is very addictive. It, it acts on the same part of the brain as opiates do. Highly, highly addictive. That's why people crave sweets or bread or alcohol, because it all breaks down into sugar. sugar. It's, you pick your poison. Follow? OK, now, when I'm speaking about, now, not all forms of sugar are bad. We put fruit out. That's natural sugar. That's fructose. But I can take a packet of sugar that the library put out on the side, unknowingly, and I can put it on you and muscle test you. 
and it will blow you out. I'll take the strongest person, anyone. You'll feel how strong you are and you'll feel what will happen to your strength just with sugar a little bit. Do you know that five grams of sugar, which is not a lot, will blow out your immune system and reduce it 50% up to five hours. That's how toxic it is in the human body. I mean, processed, refined sugars. What does that mean? What do you mean when the sugar blows out? In other words, refined sugar will, will weaken your body's functional capacity because of its toxic, toxicity so severely, only five grams of it, it will lower your immune competence 50% up to five hours. Okay? It doesn't matter whether it's raw, brown, white, refined. It doesn't matter whether it's agave, which has one of the highest toxic loads. What about honey? We know honey has been around forever. The Egyptians had it. You know, they found honey in tombs that 3,000 years later you can still eat because it never spoils. It's one of the only things that never spoils. But let's look at this, gang, okay? Nature has a way of guiding us. Nature is intelligent. Would you agree with this? Sure. Okay. So if nature is intelligent, it has a way of guiding us. It guides us. In other words, you're walking through a meadow. On the other side of the meadow, there's trees all around, but on the other side of the meadow, there's a tree. And in the distance, you can see that that tree is speckled with red dots. It brings you towards it. It tells you that there's fruit on the tree and the fruit or the berries are ripe. Whether they're blue or they're red or orange, it sets it apart and it tells you when it's ripe. Those things are good for us to eat. Now, with that in mind, with that kind of planning in mind by nature, would nature ever, think, think about this, okay, would nature ever really want us to have honey? Yeah. I would think so. Okay, where do you get honey from? Beehive. Bees. Okay, there's a beehive. Go get the honey. You want it? <laughs> Gonna get stung. <laughs> oh, now what's that, what's that designed to do? Protect the honey. Right, but is nature saying, this is for you, go get it? Right, it's good for bears. The, the calorie content in honey is so dense, bears who need to put on a lot of fat and hibernate over the winter are supposed to eat it. They have the protective fur that allows them to get to the hive and eat that honey so that when they're hibernating and not eating over the course of the winter, they have the fat reserves built up to be able to handle that. But if you're eating lots of sugar, like a bear, all year long, we don't hibernate. So it's no wonder we look like bears and it doesn't go away. You're not supposed to have honey. It's not meant for us, even though it comes from nature and it's natural. Okay? Now, John asked about stevia. Stevia comes from nature, it's sweet, and it has no glycemic load has zero calories, and it's not inflammatory. So stevia is absolutely fine. If I muscle test you with stevia, you'll test strong. So it's great. The only downside to stevia is that stevia is like wine. You know, if you're a wine drinker, you know that no two wines taste the same, no two stevias taste the same. And stevia starts out sweet, but then it has a bitter finish. So the better stevias have less of a bitter finish. So Consumers Reports actually rated the quality of stevia. And uh, they found that Wegmans, Trader Joe's, and Whole Foods had about the best stevias. And you can get them in different flavors. You can get them in orange and lemon. I even saw a chocolate one that was pretty good. You can put it in seltzer and you have a natural egg cream. And it's chocolate flavored if you like chocolate, but you don't want to eat chocolate because it's got what in it? Sugar. Now, let's talk a minute about dairy, okay, because somebody earlier had requested that I speak about what to eat and what not to eat, okay, to guide you. Dairy is highly inflammatory, just like sugar and wheat is. Now, when I say inflammatory, here's what I mean. I'm walking along the sidewalk, it's the middle of the winter time, I hit a patch of ice, I slip and I fall down, I bang my elbow, and it swells up, there's inflammation. That's not what I'm talking about by inflammatory. I'm talking about 
deep systemic inflammation. I wrote an article on it. It was in the Sentinel and I have a copy over there about ways to re reduce inflammation, systemic inflammation, meaning that this stuff is so toxic to you internally that the cells themselves actually become inflamed. Now, there's a test that's run that you can have done called a C-reactive protein. That test is one of the best biomarkers for measuring systemic inflammation and how well your body can have resistance to disease and especially heart disease. Why heart disease? The whole issue is, you know, years ago, what, what was the big thing when it came to diet that everybody was talking about and being treated for? It had to do with fat content, but it had to do with, starts with a C, everybody was regulating their levels of cholesterol. Cholesterol is fat in the diet. Now, why is it that in America, we have a much higher incidence of heart disease, and yet there are other countries in Europe who eat much more fat than we do, and yet they have lower incidences of heart disease. If it was dietary fat that caused heart problems, how come they're not ahead of us? Right, it's systemic inflammation, because in Europe, their regulatory powers won't permit them to put things in food that our government allows. And wheat and dairy and sugar are highly inflammatory. So what's the role of, of systemic inflammation to heart disease? What happens is the interior of the vessel wall becomes inflamed. And through a, a, a complex chemical process, the vessel wall becomes very sticky. And when the vessel wall becomes sticky, the fat in the blood adheres to it. And as that blood fat starts to adhere to the vessel wall, it starts to fill it up, and then it plugs it, it closes it, and that's what a heart attack is. So it's not the dietary fat that does it, it's the systemic inflammation. So taking statins and cholesterol-lowering drugs, which produce a whole nother host of problems in the body and also toxify the liver, isn't the answer to the problem because it doesn't reduce systemic inflammation. You want to reduce systemic inflammation and lose weight at the same time? Eliminate wheat, dairy, and sugar from your diet. And believe me, your waistline and your energy level will dramatically improve. You'll feel so much better. Even yogurt? Even yogurt that comes from cow's milk. There are yogurts that you can get now. There's a whole line because people are demanding this. If you go to uh, uh, Trader Joe's or Wegmans, they have yogurts that are out there on the shelves now. You have to look for it, but you'll find yogurts that are made with almond milk, you know, uh, and coconut milk yogurt, okay? Goat's milk, goat's milk, as far as I understand, goat's milk is closest to human milk. Now, why is cow's milk so bad for human beings? Why? How many stomachs does a cow have? Let's just say more than us, all right? You can Google it later. Cows have multi-chambered stomachs. Why? Because what a cow digests is easy or hard to digest? Right. What do cows eat? What does a dog eat to throw up? So what does that mean? Can a dog digest grass? How many stomachs does a dog have? How many stomachs do we have? You starting to see something here? Okay, if a cow has a multi-chambered stomach because what they eat is hard to digest, then let me ask you something. Who is cow's milk for? Little ones, baby. Baby what? Cow. Baby cows. Do you know that human beings are the only animals on the planet that continue to drink milk after we're weaned? No other animal on the planet does. We don't need milk. But where am I gonna get my dietary calcium? You can, did you know that almond milk has twice the dietary calcium as cow's milk does? And it's half the calories. It's better for you. What if I'm allergic to nuts and I can't have almond milk? Well, you can get calcium in spinach. You can get it in red meats. There are lots of other places where you can get dietary calcium. You can live a very nice life without cow's milk. What about soy milk? Well, if you're a woman, you have to be careful about soy products because of its role on the endocrine system, you know, and the propensity to increase the likelihood of breast cancer. Watch out for soy, okay? 
So wheat, dairy, and sugar are highly inflammatory, very weight productive producing and, uh, and inflammatory producing. By detoxifying the liver and the kidneys and reducing systemic inflammation, you help heal leaky gut which prevents toxins from leaching into the body and toxifying the liver further. Did you ever wonder why a person could successfully lose weight and then after they've lost the weight, they work hard to maintain a healthy diet and yet they put the weight back on again and they don't know why. Because we are human and we need to live, okay, not only, you know, no, I mean, I mean they're eating a healthy, good, relatively low-calorie diet. They're not cheating. Okay, yes, you can put weight back on again if you move back into the Cheesecake Factory, but we're not talking about that. Okay, the reason why that occurs is because the liver can actually go through a process called lipofatgenesis. Lipogenesis. It generates fat production. How come? It's got to build more closets. It's got to build a bigger pantry to put the fat in. Okay, so that's what, that's what the liver does. So that's why detoxifying the liver turns that red light into a green light. And for those of you that are interested in how you do that, I have programs in my office, one in particular, that is phenomenal at being able to cleanse the liver and the kidneys and heal leaky gut and the intestines and the lymphatics and the skin and the lungs. You know, all the organs that are responsible for getting toxins out of the body. It's great. I, I do it every nine months to a year just as a matter of wellness because we live in a very toxic world. How does the body become toxic? So many different ways. I have people who tell me, well, gee, I eat a pretty healthy diet. How could I possibly become toxic? I have a survey that you can, your answers to standardized questions we can know automatically without even sticking a needle in you, what the possibility is of your body being toxic. It takes five minutes to do, okay? Here's how. What's the alternate name for Middlesex County, New Jersey? What alley? Right. Well, how did we get that name? And because our bodies, uh, the way, the health of our body, how strong and healthy our body is, how well our energy flows, the quality of our diet, how well your body metabolizes the foods that you eat and eliminate waste, the quality of your exercise and rest and your thoughts, all of these things determine how well your body can tolerate the physical, chemical, and emotional stresses that we deal with on a daily basis. That's really what health is. The healthiest people have the greatest tolerance and adaption to stress. That's why somebody can smoke three packs of cigarettes a day and they live to have a very long life and another person can be a teetotaler, have lots of friends, and they die an early death from cancer. We're all subjected to the same stresses. How come a classroom of 30 kids in a school, half the kids can be out sick and, uh, and the other 15 are in class? And yet they're all subjected to the same exposure to bacteria and viruses. How does that work? It's tolerance to stress. How is it that somebody can play professional football and get banged and hammered and then another person sits in their car, they get, just get tapped from behind lightly, and their neck is injured so badly they can barely move it. They're practically crippled. It's how well you tolerate the physical, chemical, and emotional stresses that we deal with on a, on a, base, on a daily basis. So what affects your ability to tolerate stress? Subluxation, number one, because it interferes with energy that controls how your body works. Number two, your level, your toxic load, your level of toxicity, and how well the liver and the other organs of detoxification can remove toxins out of the body. And also, your state of mind. But your state of mind is based upon a number of things besides your upbringing. It has to do with how healthy your body is. Because the body is really a life support system for the brain. 
and the brain functions based upon the chemistry of the body. So how can a person possibly think good thoughts if they're in pain or they're sick or they're allergic or they have inflammation? People who are excessively toxic have fatigue, have joint pains, suffer from headaches, have digestive problems, have constipation. They can't sleep. What do you think it does to their mood? So it's no wonder they can suffer from depression. Somebody whose body is in pain or not functioning well and they're subluxated, if you can't move, how can you have a good quality of life? If you're restricted in any way, it doesn't feel good. And that's a bring down, no matter which way you look at it. If you can't work, if you can't have healthy relationships, you know, you have a hair trigger. People say something to you and, they, and you blow up. You didn't mean to do it, but you didn't feel good. Even the sweetest dog will turn around and bite you when it's in pain. We do the same thing. These different factors impair our body's ability to function at its best. And when it comes to weight loss, whether it's from exercise or whether it's from eating less, all of those things are compromised. So what are some of the things that you can do? Well, you can have your body checked and make sure that you're not suffering from vertebral subluxation complex. You can check to make sure that your body's not carrying an excessively toxic load. And if you are, start to remove the toxins that are in your environment to the best of your ability. For example, get rid of environmentally unfriendly cleaning products that you use in your home. Perfumes, hair dyes, makeup. Be careful of these things. Look at what's in it. The lotions that you put on your skin, the creams that you apply. Look at what's in your food. Read the labels. If you can't pronounce it, it doesn't belong in your body. Recreational and therapeutic drugs are all very toxic to you, regardless of how they're being prescribed or why you're doing it. All these things influence you. So identify those things. You know, uh, you may want to put purification systems on your water in your home. Uh, the whole fluoride issue that this town is dealing with has to do with whether or not we consider an environmental toxin safe to put in our public water supply and eliminating it. And for people who want fluoride in their water, they can always go get it out of toothpaste or bottled water or fluoride rinses or other things. You see, there's toxins all over the place. And in Middlesex County, New Jersey, we're especially subjected to it. You have to go outside. You're going to leave this talk and we're going to go out to our cars. We're going to be breathing fumes in the air from Route 18 and from the Turnpike and Route 1 and all the local traffic. New Jersey, is, New Jersey is the most densely populated state, plus it's highly industrialized. So we're breathing all this stuff. Tattoos are toxic to the body. So if you have any tats, you're going to be more toxic than you would have been if you didn't have them. Toxins are all over the place. Some you can duck, some you can't. And that's why I advocate detoxifying your body at least once a year. Because of the way you spring clean your house and you clean out your car, your, your body is basically, you clean your car, your body is the vehicle that your life rides around in. You want to take good care of it. You know, if you maintain your car and you keep everything balanced well and firing on all eight cylinders, that car is going to run better, going to get, perform better, it's going to be safer, and it's going to get better mileage, it's going to last longer, and it's going to have better resale value. What's the difference between a car and your body? You know, in theory, all the same rules apply. You see? So why wait for your, your who would want to wait for their car to break down and then decide to fix it? We know that makes no sense, and yet a lot of people take better care of their car than they do their own body. What, not to mention their own children and their bodies. Because, you know, I'm a very, God bless you, I'm a very, on the truth, I'm a very strong advocate for children's health and having children checked for subluxation because the, the, the number one cause of subluxation is the birth process. It's obstetrical manipulation at birth because once the head of the child appears, the obstetrician takes the head, twists and pulls it to get one shoulder out and then pulls it up to get the other shoulder out. 
And that's the least stressful way that a child is born. This isn't a C-section, which is more traumatic because of the drugs involved. This isn't a breech birth. The, the birth process is highly traumatic to a spine, especially the upper neck, where all the energy comes from the brain to the body and goes through the upper neck, where a baby can't even have the strength to hold its own head up. So it's very susceptible to subluxation and nerve irritation. And then that affects us for the rest of our lives. It affects how we break down our food. You could eat the best food in the world. You could put the best gas in your car. If the motor's not tuned up right, does that gas burn well or bad? Bad. bad. So if your body is not functioning well and the energy to your stomach and your digestive system isn't working well, you could eat the best foods, but you're not necessarily getting the best nutrition. You see? So that's why having a properly functioning nervous system and putting in the right foods and eliminating toxins are so important for better health. And the healthier you are, the better you lose weight. And the better you maintain a healthier weight. And that's what this is really all about. So I want to thank you all for coming down tonight. I wanted to shed some light on this very complex topic uh, from a wellness perspective, you know, instead of from a treatment-based perspective. You know, having a better functioning nervous system is gonna help your metabolism run better. It's gonna help your thyroid, your digestive system, your liver, your kidneys function much better. You'll eliminate toxins better. You'll get the most out of the foods that you eat, have a stronger immune system, move a lot better, and tend to have a much healthier lifestyle and better quality of life. If you have subluxation and interference in your nervous system, if you're not eating the right foods, or if you're putting things into your diet or into your environment that aren't wholesome and supportive for your better health, then of course you're gonna pay the price for that too. You're gonna to tend to have more pain more flare-ups of discomfort, higher susceptibility to colds and viruses, greater likelihood of disease. If you do get sick, it's gonna be harder for you to get well. And if you are healing, you won't heal as fully or as completely, and the likelihood of flare-ups are gonna be much greater. So the choice is really up to you. Life is a process, it's not an event. From the moment that we're conceived until the day we die, Life is a process, and health and sickness is part of that process. The good thing is, is that each of you have the ability to be able to make choices, and the choices that you make will also determine the life that you make. Make healthier choices, the likelihood is you're going to have a much healthier, better life. Make other choices, then you may not necessarily see what happens immediately, but down the road, you'll have to deal with something later on. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this presentation. I hope that you found it helpful. Remember the library is here to help you with our Just for the Health of It initiative. Stop by the reference desk anytime or call us at 732-390-6767 and our consumer health librarians are always available to help you.